of our roads and we continue to make sure that the roads which have been there for some time are better protected against flooding incidents. Thank you. That ends the statement from the Minister on winter resilience. We now move to the next item of business, which is our standards, procedure and public appointments committee debate on its inquiry into lobbying. I will give a few moments for the front benches to get themselves ready for that debate. And can I also invite all members who wish to take part in the debate to press the request to speak button now. Can I also advise that we have a little time in hand, so if members wish to take interventions, then the presiding officer will make sure that they are compensated for that in their speech. So, can we start the debate by calling Stuart Stevenson, the committee convener, to open the debate on behalf of the committee. Uh, Mr St Stevenson, 13 minutes. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, presiding officer. I am uh, very much obliged to the Bureau and the Conveners Committee uh, for making time available uh, for this uh, committee debate. Um, I may indulge uh, your indication that there is a little bit of slack time uh, in this debate by occasionally stopping to restart my voice, and I have the glass of water beside me, uh, should that prove to be necessary. My apologies to anybody uh, who uh, feels inconvenienced by uh, the, the tone of my voice. It is entirely to do uh, with something not under my control. Um, the word uh, lobbying can have negative connotations of deals done behind closed doors. But the starting point for the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee's inquiry is that lobbying is a legitimate, valuable and necessary part of informing a healthy democracy. The more voices that feed into the Parliament, the more informed we will be to scrutinise, to legislate, to develop new policy. On that basis, lobbying should be actively encouraged. We are founded on principles including openness and accessibility, and the committee is clear that nothing the Parliament does in response to proposals for change should inhibit our engagement with Civic Scotland. But it needs to be clear what and who has influenced decision making. It is the who, what, who knows, who is affected of lobbying that matters. The committee's work was initiated in the context of the introduction of a bill at Westminster and also of Neil Finlay's proposal to establish a statutory register of lobbyists. Helen Eady was the acting convener at that time of the committee and, as ever, we are grateful for her contribution as a parliamentarian to our committees and to the subject that's before us today. The committee has taken a great deal of evidence we are extremely grateful to all witnesses and those who have uh, submitted written views. And many of the people who have been involved in that process are with us in the public gallery this afternoon. And I am delighted to see that continuing engagement uh, with uh, the committee's activities. Because they are not for the committee, they are not for Parliament alone. Uh, the convener will do so, Mr Finlay. Neil Finlay. Um, can I ask the convener? Um, why the committee undertook uh, its investigation and who prompted that? Uh, well, as, as I say, uh, when Helen Eady was uh, acting convener at the point uh, when uh, Dave Thompson was unwell, uh, the decision was made by the committee. It was requested uh, by a range of people, but the committee itself is master of its work and under Helen Eady's uh, uh, leadership decided that we should do this. I would say just personally that uh, it may be a weakness of mine to think the best of people, but I've always thought that as an MSP we must defend us against the worst. And I hope today's debate uh, makes a contribution to uh, our all uh, getting to that point. Now, uh, if you wish, yes. Neil Finlay. Can I ask the convener if he was, if the committee, uh, whether uh, he is convener or the previous convener was asked by the government to have a, a, an inquiry into this. Government, the government are very keen Stevens. that we should do this, but they were not the only ones who were taking uh, an interest in the subject. And the important thing is to be aware the committee itself 
could decide what it would do, and the Committee on a Cross-Party Basis agreed to do it. Now, I'm going to make some progress, but I will welcome further interventions uh, on the substance of uh, what I'm going to say. The important thing is that this is a matter of huge relevance for us, and in coming to Parliament today, we thought it important, before we come to our conclusions and publish them, to take the temperature of uh, members and uh, beyond the, the Parliament. Our inquiry set out to investigate whether there was an issue with undue influence or access to politicians in Scotland. The good news for MSPs is that we received no evidence of a scandal on the horizon about lobbying in Scotland. The evidence we did hear from a diverse range of views uh, painted a broadly positive picture. But, and it's an important but, even if everything is fine, are we providing enough information to others that enables them to decide that that is the case? With additional powers coming to this parliament, there may be the need for additional safeguards. And in any event, we have to revisit our rules and make sure that they are prepared for what may come in the future in the way of challenge. Many witnesses in particular were critical of recent Westminster changes, and I'm sure that will feature in the debate. The UK legislation on lobbying was not held in high regard by a good number of our witnesses. It was described as a sham by one, and another said that they hoped it would be repealed. We have an opportunity to think calmly and collectively about whether and how to change the lobbying regime in Scotland, and also what the pros and cons of tightening the rules on lobbying would be. We found uh, that a good question to get the debate started in committee was who should the onus be on in making details of lobbying activity public? Should the onus be on the lobbyist, the person being lobbyist, and that will include many of us, most of us, all of us, or should it be on both? Plenty of people consider that politicians and senior officials should make their diaries public which in practice would mean publishing details of contacts with lobbyists. Others suggested that... I will indeed. Yeah, I thank the member for giving way. I mean, I've not been involved in this myself, but when I saw this suggestion of publicising our diaries, I mean, I personally would be happy to do that, but I think there are some individuals and groups who come to me confidentially would be quite nervous about their details being in the public domain. Um, the member makes a perfectly proper point. I will develop that a little bit later in my uh, remarks. Um, others who came to the committee suggested there was no substitute for a register of lobbyists. It could simply be a complementary measure, the publishing of diaries. However you capture lobbying activity, the first question has to be, what is lobbying? Now, that sounds like a simple question, but the answer is one of the most contested in political science. The temptation is to go for a very simple wording, something like lobbying is contact with a person in public office in an attempt to influence. Now, that sounds very straightforward. Uh, but what form of contact should be included? And doesn't that definition make just about everybody you come across in your working life as a politician a lobbyist? If I and my train journey home tonight end up talking about public policy to somebody sitting in an adjacent seat, would I have to register it using that definition? Politicians make contact with people in many ways. To name a few, we're emailed briefings for chamber debates, we're phoned, tweeted, Facebook messaged, we meet people in cross-party groups and at events inside this building and in our constituencies, and we meet people by absolute happenstance. Getting even more complicated, we read in the media about research and grassroots campaigns, some of which have begun by third parties, the names of which sometimes deliberately receive no coverage at all. Which elements of these types of contact could be captured in a lobbying register? And if we go for a register, who should be required to register? Some approaches in other countries just require consultant lobbyists to register. But the evidence we received suggested that so much of modern lobbying activity is in-house, meaning that just registering consultant lobbyists would not capture enough, and I think there would be agreement about that. Other witnesses suggested that in-house lobbying was hard to capture, as lobbying is incorporated into communication strategies and into the day jobs of people with multifaceted roles. 
Now, it should be noted that there was not in our witnesses uh, and uh, those who responded to our consultation a lack of willingness to make activities public. Lots of organisations made clear that they already publicise information, not least to demonstrate to the outside world, their customers and stakeholders, the value of their work. There are also regulatory requirements for charities and for others to adhere to, which require information to be published. Unions will wish to highlight the fruits of their labours to their members and to others. A number of public affairs organisations publish voluntary registers and have relevant codes of conduct. It's often the logistics of how our registration system would work that was the focus of concern. Some suggested that systems that exempt groups based on size, purpose, amount of lobbying activity or income, or that place thresholds on when to register lobbying activity could be problematic as exceptions can create unforeseen loopholes and unintended consequences. Another approach would be a sliding scale of information required proportionate to the size of the organisation. For example, it could require some organisations, like full-time consultant lobbyists, to register in full regularly, and small charities with more limited resources to register activity less regularly and in less details. But the proportionate approach requires a lot of careful consideration on how you would set the rules for such a sliding scale. For example, should a large charity lobbying for big government contracts, as many do, register as much as consultant lobbyists, or should they register as much as smaller charities? The idea of uh, charging a fee to register was almost entirely rejected in evidence on the basis that this would create a barrier or, at worst, a deterrent to people seeking to engage with the Parliament and with government. So any additional costs, such as for a registrar or for software to create a modern register, would need to be met from the public purse. As ever, when there are financial considerations, members will need to consider whether the funds required are justified and will achieve the objectives of increased transparency, accountability and, as intended by some witnesses, an improvement in trust in the political process and politicians. We also looked at sanctions, with some arguing that naming and shaming lobbyists acting inappropriately would in and of itself have a powerful effect, curbing their ability to engage in future. But others suggested that for the bigger lobbying firms, nothing short of big financial penalties could curb uh, behaviours. And that raises the question, in what circumstances should sanctions be imposed and by whom? We heard from some that there are issues with existing voluntary registers being too weak. They lack the ability to oblige information or to sanction effectively. Others suggested that a full statutory register in Scotland was a disproportionate effect uh, to crack a nut. In response to the suggestion that a register would never provide the full picture of lobbying activity, those pushing for increased transparency suggested that a fuller, if still incomplete, picture would nonetheless be beneficial. Interesting developments elsewhere also informed us with the National Assembly for Wales inquiry deciding Wales should stop short of a register but rather look at other measures. Now, turning to the point that Mr Mason raised, I've tested the water. I've reviewed my own diary and have established a published copy of those diary entries I consider to be a lobby. Now, it proved very simple to do and to publish the parts of my diary. And you can see the results, if you're interested, at lobbying.stuartstevenson.scot. I tweeted about that this morning, and interestingly enough, uh, we've already had over 200 views of the information uh, that I've provided. So they're interested in me. I don't know if they'll be interested in anybody else in the chamber, but at least they're interested in me. But seriously, have, have a look at what I've done and it's just a personal venture, nothing to do with the Parliament or the committee, give me feedback, and that will inform the committee and also help us uh, as a committee see 
what really the effort is for the broader generality of members rather than for perhaps one of your more technically illiterate members that perhaps might be myself. Um, and members who want to do it for themselves in the short term, I'm quite happy to sit down and talk about how it's done. Now, I'm coming towards the end, a little bit more to say, but be warned, at the end of the day, when you do that, there's quite a lot of judgment calls to be made about what is or is not you're being lobbied. If you meet a group uh, with a small campaign in your constituency, that can presumably be considered to be constituency casework and so needn't feature in a published record of lobbying contact. But if you meet them again and they have a local business represented there or even a professional lobbyist with them, that will almost certainly tip them into you have to uh, publish it. That's a view I would take. Members will note that committee members' contributions in this debate will largely consist of snippets of the views of stakeholders. They will be reading out 100-word statements from them. Now, these are not necessarily the views of the members themselves, but what we're trying to do as a committee is to bring the outside into the debate to the floor of the chamber. Uh, this matters to folk out there. It's not just about our own internal naval gazing. Uh, while we debate, uh, I know because I've looked, there are already live interchanges and debates on Facebook and Twitter, and the committee will look at these after the debate and see if that helps us understand. Now, that kind of completes the whistle-stop tour of the issues we've been tussling with. It's a complex issue uh, altogether, a complex area. Passions can run high. We had one very, very spirited debate, which was actually between panellists. Fortunately, there was a neutral person sitting between the two of them. Um, and you can look at the video if you want to. Uh, now it's over to our colleagues here in the Parliament and people who are watching uh, to help us understand what the correct balance between regulation and ensuring the Parliament remains open and accessible as it currently is. The committee is not set on its findings. We haven't attempted yet to reach consensus on most of or many of the issues. So it genuinely is a chance today to influence what we will put in the report and make recommendations to you in due course. I thank you very much indeed for the extra time, presiding officer. I found it useful. Hopefully everyone else did as well. Many thanks. Now I call on Joe Fitzpatrick, nine minutes or thereby, Minister. Presenting officer, I want to start by thanking the convener for his thoughtful opening remarks and for the efforts he made, the commendable efforts he made with the challenges of his voice today. But I also want to um, thank the entire Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee as a whole for bringing this issue to the Chamber today. Um, I think it's appropriate also at this stage to put, take the opportunity to put on record the Government's support for the committee inquiry. Their work is central to ensuring that we find a consensual way forward. The inquiry is being conducted in a thorough and inclusive way, hearing from a wide range of stakeholders. Their views will be vital in ensuring that Parliament can take forward reform on a balanced and proportionate basis. For the Government's part, I have also met with several stakeholder organisations, all of whom I think have subsequently given evidence to the committee. Today's chamber debate now allows individual MSPs to contribute to and inform the committee's work. Rather than the usual format where the chamber debates a committee's final conclusions, the SPPA committee appears to be very much in listening mode. And I think that is to be welcome, um, as is the interactive debate that I understand is happening concurrently on social media. Hopefully the government comms will be able to join in as, as I speak. Presenting officer, Parliament has always led the way on matters relevant to its own affairs, and lobbying is no exception. Members will be keenly anticipating the committee's final report, but it is important that the committee should be given the time and space to get it right. In the government's view, any reforms to lobbying practice should be proportionate, evidence-based, and able to command widespread support from both stakeholders and political parties. From the outset, the Government has been very clear that lobbying is a subject where Parliament should assume a central role. That was the case in Session 1 Standards Committee when they conducted a review into lobbying in 2002, and it remains the case now. The current committee inquiry feels like a natural and consistent progression from that previous work, and rightly maintains the Parliament's central role in determining best practice. 
I have no doubt that its findings will be carefully thought through, collaborative and consensual, helped in part by this debate. I am sure we will all agree that improving public confidence in Parliament is a consensus issue, the responsibility for which is shared by us all. It follows then that such matters should, be considered on a, should not be considered on a party political basis, and nor indeed in a vacuum. Issues of probity should command a balanced, reasoned and consensual approach, which is what this Parliament has adopted since 1999. That, of course, is in stark contrast to the UK Government's approach. The Transparency of Lobbying, Non-Party Campaigning and Trade Union Administration Act 2014 shows what can go wrong when party politics are applied to an issue of public confidence. The UK Government adopted a rushed and partisan approach to the obvious detriment of the end product, which was roundly criticised. And we need to remember that the urgency of the UK legislation was in response to accusations made against the activities of elected representatives at Westminster. In Scotland, the context has thankfully been rather different. The driver here is not remedial action. The driver here is instead part of an ongoing process of ensuring that we take stock and consider whether improvements can be made to the transparency of lobbying. As the convener has already said, analysing appropriate checks and balances in this complex area is a challenging task. Reforms must be necessary, proportionate and achieve the aim of delivering increased transparency in lobbying activity. The aim has quite rightly been to proceed methodically rather than quickly. Presiding officer, I would like to be clear that my contribution today does not seek to preempt the committee's findings. I can, however, offer some thoughts on government's underlying thinking that I hope the Chamber will find useful. I believe and hope others agree that lobbying plays an invaluable and necessary part in policy making. It should be viewed as a positive activity, as I think the, the convener said, consistent with the open and inclusive approach taken by government and by this parliament. And I note with interest a survey in Holyrood magazine in January of this year, which concluded four-fifths of members in this parliament find direct contact with external organisations useful in their day-to-day -day role. And I fully concur with that view. I think it's very important, not just for members, but also for government. With that in mind, the government's view is that there are three main policy principles that should guide how we approach the issues of lobbying. Firstly, any erosion of the Parliament's principles of openness, ease of access and accountability must be avoided. Reforms should not restrict how stakeholders and members of the public engage in public policy issues. Secondly, any proposed measures must complement the existing frameworks without compromising their effective operation. For example, the interest of members of the Scottish Parliament Act 2006, the MSP Code of Conduct, the Ministerial Codes, Standing Orders. Any proposed measures must therefore be clear and transparent in their purpose and operation. And thirdly, any solution must be proportionate, simple in its operation and able to command broad support within and out with Parliament. Presiding officer, I believe that if we follow these principles, we can reach a balanced, well-rounded conclusion that we, we can all stand behind. The convener has already mentioned the summary of evidence published by, by the committee. Um, that input from a wide range of stakeholders has proved invaluable in helping to identify practical ways to enhance public transparency in lobbying activity. Everyone giving evidence has been clear that there is no problem with probity in this area. Existing systems in Scotland to govern the probity of MSPs have not been criticised. Standing orders, MSP and ministerial codes are all seen to be robust. Instead, it is the area of transparency where there is potential room for improvement. Evidence has helped us to tease out what information could be helped, helpful to the public in terms of understanding the connection between lobbyists and MSPs. The question now is how we can further improve on our existing systems and achieve an even greater level of transparency in respect of lobbying and parliamentary activity in general. That involves analysing and identifying where there are, are gaps around these systems and how they could be addressed. A common theme has been the value and character of statutory measures. For example, 
who should be covered by a register of lobbyists and what additional information should be contained within it. I was also interested by the frequent reference to non-statutory measures and how they might contribute to an overall package to improve the trans transparency of our Parliament. The publication of MSP's meetings, as mentioned by the, the convener, uh, with out outside interest groups, was probably the most repeated example of this. And I think it is helpful that the convener um, has taken the time to show what that might look like um, um, by publishing um, his own um, agenda um, on his own website. Um, the government, too, took a decision some time ago to do likewise, and members can see what that looks like by searching for engagements on the Scottish Government's website. As I've alluded to, an important question is how our existing robust systems can be further improved. I'm looking forward to hearing what other members have to say on these points. Presiding officer, before I move to conclude, I want to highlight just two of the many interesting perspectives that were raised during the committee's overall evidence session. Uh, first, that of Stuart Allen, who was the Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life. Mr Allen confirmed that in his role, he had encountered no evidence of lobbying impropriety in Scotland. He therefore did not consider there to be any justification to legislate to establish a Scottish lobbying register. He also suggested that increased transparency could instead be delivered via amendments to surrounding frameworks, which he considered to be robust. Those frameworks, as I've alluded to earlier, include the MSP Code, the Ministerial Code and the Civil Service Code. Mr Allen considered that there was scope to consider the enhancement of, uh, of a voluntary, reg voluntary registration schemes. In his view, there was potential for Parliament to engage with the lobbying industry to establish a code of conduct. He said we'd bring... Uh, he said we'd bring... I'll, I'll finish the quote and then I'll go on and then I'll finish my other example and then bring in Mr Finlay. Um, Code of conduct. He said we'd bring a great deal of credibility while leaving you with flexibility when things were going wrong. This is something he said to be, to be said for that. And moving on, um, others of course, um, Mr Finlay being one of them, provided a, a different perspective during their evidence sessions. Alexander Runswick from Unlock Democracy commented that the Parliament should act now in a calm climate before there was vicious, a vicious circle of ongoing scandal followed by inquiries. Dr William Dinian from Spinwatch made the point that publishing MSP's diaries would be helpful, but it would not achieve the overall aim of transparency in itself. And Dr Dinian um, added that, in his view, any mechanism must be statutory. A voluntary system would not work. And, and in addition, um, Tamsin Cave from the Alliance for Lobbying Transparency considered that financial disclosure was a key point as Fair well as Minister, I need to draw you to a close lobbying shortly. activity. My point about those two points was um, in raising those two very diverse perspectives um, is to recognise the complexity of the task being undertaken by the, by the committee. Presenting officer, in, in conclusion, we are very mindful that no doubt collectively we welcome the strong sense of public engagement which is currently exists in policy making in Scotland. The engagement is healthy, constructive and thankfully free from allegations of impropriety. That is the natural environment for this Parliament. We enjoy a positive climate that encourages participation, builds trust and above all helps to preserve the integrity of our inst institutions. The outcomes of the SPPA committee inquiry must be taken forward in a way that protects and encourages that strong connection we have with the people of Scotland. Once more, I commend the way the committee is progressing these issues and I look forward to a consensual outcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. I now call on Paul Martin. We're rapidly using up time. Mr Finlay, point of order. Given that the Minister has just given his, uh, his speech in the, the, the debate, I'm unsure if I caught what he said there and whether he actually stated whether the government was still intending to legislate my proposal. Maybe you could help me in, in confirming that, whether he made that comment in his speech. I'm afraid it's not a point of order, but um, I would hope that the government and other speakers from the government benches may confirm or deny or at least shed light on the point you raise. Your point is nonetheless noted. Thank you. Now call on Paul Martin. Mr Martin, uh, six minutes or thereby, please. Officer, can I uh, first of all, like others, uh, commend the good work of the Standards and Procedures Committee 
uh, and welcome the approach of today's debate, which is to uh, lay an interim report uh, before us and allow for the opportunities for members to contribute to the debate. I think also that we should recognise the role that Neil Finlay has played in ensuring that this very issue is brought before the committee and also welcome, which I hopefully will be, the fact that the government have adopted uh, Mr Finlay's approach and adopted his members' bill, and I'm sure that can be elaborated on uh, further. And can I just put on the record that Neil Finlay is yet to lobby me uh, in his role as uh, seeking election as Labour leader, but I'm sure that will come uh, in due time. Uh, so in Austin, I think also it should be noted in the consultation process that Neil Finlay set in place that over 90% of those who contributed to uh, the uh, consultation exercise says that they were in favour uh, of the bill being taken forward. And I think many of our contributions today should be about ensuring that we can take it forward and ensure that we consider the wide range of views that we've contributed to in the Parliament. Uh, going forward, though, we are in absolutely no doubt that a statutory register of lobbyists is a must if we are to improve uh, transparency and maintain public confidence in the decision-making of this uh, Scottish Parliament. It should also be noted that the committee heard during its many evidence sessions that unless action is taken uh, to make the system of lobbying more, more transparent and accountable, then there's the standard is inevitably it will be, the standards will be reduced. Whatever any politician, whenever any politician is found abusing their position of privilege, privilege it affects the reputation of this Parliament. Uh, and we ought to all of our constituents to ensure that we maintain the integrity of Parliament at every possible opportunity. Officer, introducing transparency into the lawmaking process can only be good and would indeed help the role of this Parliament in reducing the distrust that many people feel in respect of their MSPs uh, and ensuring this Parliament can operate in an effective manner. A statutory register, I believe, and we believe in these benches, can be the backbone of a new law that gives people confidence that the laws have been introduced fairly and not just in the interests of those who have the experience behind them and to have the professional lobbyists on their side. Of course, there will be critics of the statutory register process. There will be those who will argue that it will only be certain lobbying activities recorded, such as formal meetings, or the financial threshold will be a particular barrier in that respect. Presiding officer, many of these arguments were made against the Freedom of Information Act, the Register of Social Landlords, uh, the Members' Interest Act, which was passed in this Parliament. We need to recognise and we need to go forward in the manner that many members and many of those who have contributed to this process have contributed to. One thing that we would recognise, and as Joe Fitzpatrick has alluded to, lobbying should be a democratic right. It should be protected. And any restriction on a person's ability to can, can, can communicate with their elected representative should be protected. But let's be clear, uh, this is not the pensioner visiting our surgery, raising concerns about their local bus service. This is professional lobbyists, where there's an industry of £2 billion per year that has grown uh, over the last decade. Uh, it is very right that there should be some regulation process put in place to deal with this. And it's for those very companies who are in danger on occasions of overstepping the mark that we should have put in place and effective me put in place effective measures to deal with undue influencing. The test of this new legislation would be the transparency that we can be offered to the public. It is Labour opi Labour's opinion that we should look at the relationship of those who have been lobbied to ensure that the very principles of transparency are put in place. Saying also, we also believe that there has to be rules put in place to deal with those who are former ministers, and I would have welcomed a contribution from the minister on how this issue could be taken forward, and I'm not, not sure what evidence further that the committee can take in this, but we do have to deal with the very fact that undue influencing can be a feature in former ministers, and it's a challenge uh, that the Westminster government have faced in particular, and it's something that we have to ensure uh, that we take forward. President also, it is also our position that at the moment... Absolutely. Stevenson. Um, just, just, just to, to, be, to be aware that uh, the uh, ministerial code provides that for a period two years afterwards you can't, for example, take up employment and you have to get agreement. Now, I accept that there are 
it's the same arrangement for Westminster, that that doesn't work as well as it should do. And perhaps it is something the committee should be looking at. In my particular case, my two years is just up. The job offers haven't been flooding in, regretfully, but there we are. Paul Martin. Uh, in your final minute, Senator, please, Mr. Martin. Uh, welcome this contribution from Minister. And uh, I'm not sure how disappointed he is that the job offers haven't come in, but I'm sure it's something they can refer to. In conclusion, President Officer, I think it is very important to recognise in many ways that transparency in this Parliament is crucial. And I think we should recognise that the independence referendum brought about one result, uh, and that was that people of Scotland want to engage with this Parliament. Uh, and we have to ensure that people feel uh, that that will be done in a fair and an effective manner and that everyone will have access to this Parliament, uh, this Parliament regardless of what their status is, status is and regardless of who they are. I think that's the very principles that we would wish uh, to move forward with. Uh, President Officer, we welcome the report and we look forward to the final report being laid before the Parliament. Thanks. We're now tight for time, so I now call on Cameron McCameron up to six minutes. Mr McCameron. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, as they say on this, swung both ways. I could not decide what was going to happen, and we were convinced many times by the arguments on both sides. I'm all going to read out at the moment what five or six people have said who've lobbied us with, this, with their um, opinions. And I'll read them out, and at the end I'll come to the conclusion. It's really what does and doesn't constitute lobbying. That's what worried everybody. And it's very difficult to do. I think it's just very difficult to define. The Federation of Small Businesses said... The openness of the Scottish Parliament processes and the integrity of our elected representatives mean we see no need to introduce new statutory regulations on lobbyists. However, should Parliament disagree, we submit that trying to define adequately which individuals must register and what activity they must record would prove impractical. We believe that a less burdensome, more cost-effective solution lies in the elected representatives maintaining a public register of their meetings with anyone who is seeking to advocate a particular policy to them. Doing this through an enhanced MSP's register of interest would seem to be a neat, cost-neutral solution. Spinwatch said, The Committee's acceptance of the case for change is very welcome. It is vital that proposals for lobbying registration are proportionate and will aid transparency and accountability. As Holyrood is set to gain more powers, it is also likely to attract more lobbying. Now is an ideal time to create a lobbying register which discloses key information on who is lobbying, whom they are lobbying, and on what issues and what resources are devoted to influencing decision-making. The lobbying information already available is piecemeal, disjointed, and often unreliable. A central mandatory register that captures all organised lobbying is therefore required. The Confederation of British Industry said, Lobbying is essential to the political process and must be conducted in an open and transparent way. Measures already exist to support transparency, including a register of the Scottish Government Minister's external meetings and the MSP Code of Conduct. Any new regulatory pr proposals should adhere to the Scottish Government principles for better regulation and be workable and proportionate response to a clearly defined problem. We believe that further clarification and evidence is needed of a problem with lobbying in Scotland before legislation is taken forward. Concern should also be given to the regulatory convergence with the regime at a UK level in order to minimise the burden on those who are affected. Cancer Research UK said, Cancer Research UK supports the introduction of a universal register accompanied by a code of conduct in order to uphold public confidence in lobbying. We believe that bad practice in campaigning activity should be exposed and eradicated, using this opportunity to regulate reasonably all professional lobbyists. We welcome your committee's inquiry into lobbying, Lobbying is a hugely important tool for charities, whether used to encourage change or maintain a positive status quo, raising awareness or provide expertise to strengthen strategy. We believe the Scottish Government should protect the ability of charities to campaign. The Association of Professional Political Consultants, a very important contribution. The Association of Professional Political Consultants is a self-regulatory and representative body for professional political practitioners ensuring the highest standards of honesty, integrity and professionalism amongst members who are all required to adhere to a strict code of conduct. We suggest that the simplest way to achieve transparency in lobbying would be to make public the official diaries of ministers, civil servants and MSPs. We can only support the introduction of a statutory register of lobbying, providing that it applies equally to all those who engage in lobbying on a professional basis and does not extend to financial information. Those are the, what, the, the submissions that we had. I have actually failed to 
as I say, I swung both ways in a way because I, when we had somebody in, it was very good. When we had something, I was convinced that we should do some lobbying. But it's so difficult to define, and it failed in the end to be convinced of the necessity. What does and doesn't constitute lobbying? When I go and see somebody, I speak to them in, in a bar, is that lobbying? Somebody says to me, it's lobbying. It's very difficult. Publicising diaries is dangerous because if you want to hide anything, you just don't put it in the diary. Uh, on the basis of conflicting evidence, I think we need more safeguards. But I really found it very difficult to, find, to come to an opinion. I welcome everybody else's. Thank you. Thanks so much. <clears throat> and we now move to the open debate. And I call on Fiona MacLeod to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, it was interesting when the convener opened his remarks by talking about how lobbying is all, often viewed very negatively. And I think um, part, the heart of what we are doing as a committee sometimes is down to what is lobbying. Members know that I'm a librarian, that uh, my whole profession is about ensuring that people have access to information and have the evidence to inform uh, any decisions they're making. And I think that evidence-based policy development is the, one of the most important things that we can do as parliamentarians. So for me, is lobbying a negative or is lobbying part of the process of ensuring that this parliament is open, accessible and transparent? I was first elected in 1999 and all those maxims that we talked about are being our principles of openness were so important to us, those that got, when we first got elected. And it has continued to be that, I'm sure, for every MSP. And one of the things that this, this inquiry has made me think, think about a lot is being a member of a cross-party group where this parliament is open to allow people who work in a particular area or people who live a life experience in a particular area are able to come to this parliament and discuss things openly and, and easily with parliamentarians. So for me, this really rests on, as we go through this process, are we sure that we are still going to be an open and accessible parliament? But as the minister said in his, com his contribution, openness and accessibility, yes, but is that transparent? And maybe that is the nub of what we're looking at here. So I'm eager to hear from other MSPs. I was fascinated by the evidence that we were given, and I would like to give some examples from the evidence that we've received to our committee. But I'd like to start by giving you uh, examples from two of my constituents. Um, and it just shows, as the convener said, you know, people have been tweeting and answering about this all day, and I have had uh, constituents getting in touch with me. Without naming them, if I could just quote from two of the constituents that got in touch with me. MSPs should know what their constituents feel about such a register. When the Scottish Parliament was founded, it was meant to have been so open and easy to access, that it was thought that a register of lobbyists wouldn't be necessary. Whilst people who regularly interact with the Parliament may think this openness has been maintained, I would suggest the general public have a very different perception of the accessibility of MSPs. They have the impression that the powerful and connected have a better quality of access to politicians than they do as citizens. Lobbyists are seen to be by, large, by a large number of people as serving big business in an effort to encourage Parliament to do what they want and not what is in the best action for the general public. This lady then concludes, I would suggest that a register of lobbyists will only increase that perception. If the Parliament really is open and easy to access, then why do we need a register for lobbyists? But then my next constituent that contacted me says, and I quote, firstly, I'm not at all sure how much lobbying goes on in the Scottish Parliament and what effect lobbying might have. I think when you, as an MSP, are contacted by a constituent about any matter, that cannot constitute lobbying. What I would be more concerned about is the possibility that a vested interest of some kind targets MSPs directly to make a case, particularly if the interest is a commercial one. And this gentleman comes to the opposite conclusion. For that reason, I think I would be in a favour of a register of lobbyists which could be consulted online. And he finishes, 
I think the main benefit of some formal system whereby lobbying can be made visible is to act as a deterrent in that those involved in questionable areas of lobbying might be more inhibited if they were to be aware that what they were doing is readily evident. So I think, presiding officer, from just those two examples from constituents, you're seeing they're both coming from the same place but arriving at the opposite conclusions. And I realise that we're now short of time, so I have to go to my conclusion, presiding officer. A lot of the other quotes I was going to give can be found in the um, official report of the evidence to the committee over the course of this inquiry. So in conclusion, presiding officer, I think we have to ask a number of questions. How do we, how do we define lobbying? How do we record lobbying once we've defined it? But how do we ensure the two-way flow of information from this parliament out, but from outside into this parliament to ensure that we have evidence-based policy making? And for me, the utter bottom line is, how do we remain true to our founding principles of openness and accessibility? Thank you. <clears throat> And now call on Malcolm Tism to be followed by George Adam. Uh, exactly officer, maybe some claim. people come to the conclusion that we need regulation because they have a negative view of lobbying. But my own view is that I support regulation based on a very positive view uh, of lobbying. I don't think uh, those two positions are in any way uh, incompatible. Uh, I think that um, we can agree broadly on a definition of lobbying in terms of an attempt to influence policy by relationship with government or MSPs, and that is clearly uh, central to the way this parliament and I imagine um, all parliaments uh, operate. And as I say, I regard that uh, as a positive issue. I don't think uh, that it's as problematic as Stuart Stevenson suggested in terms of how broad that definition is. I don't think anyone's suggesting that any individual on the train or anywhere else who is not part of some group or organization is going to be caught within any definition uh, of lobbying. But on the other hand, I wouldn't want it to be too restrictive. And I was struck in the oral evidence, uh, which I read uh, this week, that many people from small organizations were actually very keen to support the idea of regulation. But I think the key thing for them was not proceeding by exclusion, but proceeding by proportionality. So as long as it's not going to take up uh, a great deal of time and bureaucracy for small organisations, many of them uh, are, are in fact very keen uh, to be uh, part of such a system. And, and later on, uh, I'll give some specific uh, examples uh, of that. But before I proceed, I have to say I am slightly mystified by the position of the government on this, and perhaps they'll clarify in the wind-up uh, uh, statement. My understanding is that in this parliament, when a member introduces a, a, a bill, uh, there is clearly provision for the government to take it over. But my understanding is that it takes it over uh, with the intention of forwarding at least the broad objectives uh, of the bill, if not every single detail uh, of it. That's obviously unlike the parliament at UK. But if we're now finding out that a government can take up a bill as it seems in order I wouldn't say as, put it as strong as to sabotage it, but in order not to advance the details of it, then it does seem to me that perhaps we need to look at the system in this parliament. And it may be that in that regard, the UK parliament is fairer to private members when they bring forward Minister, a bill. Yeah, I give way. Mm. Mr Chisholm, I, I have been on this committee for two years and everybody knows that I take my committee very, very seriously. So when the government came, to, you know, said to the committee, as did many other organisations following Mr Finlay's introduction of his bill, that this was something that this parliament should look at seriously. There is no more relevant committee to this parliament to look at this issue than the Standards and Procedures Committee of this parliament. We take our work very seriously. No, I mean, a little extra time, Mr that, Chisholm. My more general procedural point is if the government wasn't minded to support Neil Finlay's bill, they should not have taken over. That seems to me to be, perhaps that's something the Procedures Committee can, uh, can look at uh, in a subsequent investigation. Anyway, uh, I certainly support uh, regulation, but as others have said, we certainly don't want to copy the, the, um, the, practice, the, the legislation of the, the UK Parliament, which in fact, incidentally, uh, Labour is committed to repealing. And I was struck by the description of that legislation as a small net with massive holes in it. And of course, particularly worrying is the damaging effect it has on the lobbying of the third sector uh, in England. I was, of course, intrigued that SCBO, unlike many of its constituent organisations, was also adamantly opposed to 
um, regulation in Scotland. I don't know whether they were confusing it with some of the things that have happened uh, in England. But obviously they are proposing MSPs' diaries, and that's come up in the uh, debate uh, so far today. But it does seem to me that that leaves a great many holes, because we all know that so much of the lobbying is done with civil servants, with special advisers, and so on. So I don't see how publishing MSPs' diaries deals with the problem at all. Now, it seems to me there are two arguments uh, for uh, regulations, uh, preventative and positive. I thought the preventative side was put very well by Des Moxon at the committee, quoting briefly, is there a problem? We do not know. That might be because we might not have the systems in place that would identify whether there was a problem. So we hope there isn't a problem, but we have to take action to make sure that there isn't either now or in the future uh, a problem. But the positive reasons, of course, some of the words have been used already. I think transparency is the key word. We want transparency about uh, how, uh, you know, how decisions uh, are made, transparency about the interactions between government and MSPs uh, and, uh, and, and, and lobbyists. And I believe that will make for uh, make us more trustworthy, which is important in terms of our position with the public, more accountable. Uh, and I think, crucially, it's very much in accord with the founding principles of the Parliament. Again, some people are almost saying that this is contrary to the founding principles uh, of the Parliament. I was very struck uh, by the very strong words of my constituent, Jenny Kemp, who, who obviously is the director of Zero Tolerance. I thought she gave really powerful persuasive, persuasive evidence. I haven't got time to quote much, but she says, in general, anything that aligns with the founding principles of the Parliament and opens it up and makes it more accessible has to be a good thing. So she was arguing arguing strongly that it was in accord uh, with the founding principles of the Parliament. I thought it was really interesting as well, given the concerns that some people have about the effect of this on small voluntary organisations, that she said it would be good for small voluntary organisations like Zero Tolerance. She said, uh, she said organisations like hers would gain a lot from more transparency because there isn't a level playing field at present and anything that opened up the Parliament had to be a good thing in helping to create a more level playing field. So I think that today we should, and I hope the Government, when it's wind up, will quite clearly state that it, in principle it supports uh, regulation and a statutory register of lobbyists. Of course a lot of the detail has to be worked out, and I'm no expert on this to, to, to tell you what the detail is uh, at all, but uh, I think in principle we should be saying to say we accept the need for regulation and for a statutory register of lobbyists. Many thanks. I now call on George Adam to be followed by Jim Hume. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, you know, I found this inquiry fascinating, and uh, there's no hyperbole there when I say that, because I believe we've only currently just scratched the surface of the issue, because it is, as the convener quite rightly says, a very complex issue. And we have to ensure that we don't rush into things and go down knee-jerk reaction that the Westminster government already has done. You know, I think we've yet to scratch uh, the surface of the whole uh, issue. And one of the other things is, myself, I still haven't made up my mind as in what is the best way forward, personally, as a committee member, because the Scottish Parliament has a reputation for openness, accessibility and accountability. And nothing we should do in this issue should restrict citizens' ability to engage with this Parliament. Our approach has been in stark contrast to that of the UK government's rushed and partisan approach to lobbying. And I'll explain that further as I continue uh, on with my speech. Uh, the situation we find ourselves with, we've been fortunate in Scotland that we haven't had the issues that have been seen in Westminster, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't a need for legislation as well. So there may be something we have to look at as we, things go further on. The committee began its inquiry into lobbying in September 2013 and since received a wide range of evidence from various groups. Many of the things have already been said and this valuable information from across Civic Scotland has been good as we have approached this. You know, but we have to, uh, as, the, UK, as the, the, the Minister already said, is we have to make sure that we do get this right. In 2013, the UK Government introduced the Transparency of Lobbying, Non-Party Campaigning and trade union administration bill. It's a mouthful to say, let alone actually achieve anything, because the evidence we received was that it actually doesn't do anything to help any groups and acts as a way of stopping groups to come and actually interact. The UK Act puts heavy legal burdens on charities and third sector bodies and uh, those campaigning on political issues. Uh, Canada, USA were mentioned during some of the, the information we received and Canada was put down as a, an excellent open transparent system. Uh, but with that, as I've already said by the uh, 
the convener. There was costs involved as well when you looked at the, the situation. But some of the evidence that we received and some of the things that were said after Westminster legislation, the TUC General Secretary, Francis O'Grady, said in April the Act does nothing to curb the power of corporate lobbyists, yet hinders free speech, shuts campaigning community groups out of the democratic process and ties unions up in needless red tape. So we need to make sure that the founding principles of this place are remembered, that when we take anything forward. You know, there was also a, a situation with Bill Hayes, General Secretary of Communication Workers Union. The lobbying industry is free to continue secretly cajoling politicians, while charities and trade unions will be silenced. Now, that was with the Westminster uh, uh, model that is currently going that they were talking about. And we have to make sure that we don't go down that route, because if we have that knee-jerk reaction, if we went down that stage, can I just finish this point, Mr Finlay? We have a situation where the founding principles of this parliament would have difficulty uh, to be sustained. And we have to ensure that we don't make these... Make One of the biggest issues that came up during this whole ideal was the definition of lobbying. What exactly was... I know other members have said that. What exactly was lobbying? Yes, I will do, Mr Finlay. Neil Finlay. It's in relation to the, the, the bill that was passed at, uh, at, at the House Commons. I'm sure, uh, being a, a thoroughly decent man, he will accept that my proposal has nothing at all, does not reflect what happened there, and is a completely different proposal. Adam. Saying, uh, presiding officer, I'm saying to Mr. Finlay that the whole idea is that we have to make sure that we don't go down that route. You know, we have to make sure that if we do legislate, it has to be robust. It has to be something that still makes sure that people can interact with this parliament. You know, the Scottish Parliament's reputation for openness and accessibility and accountability was part of what the, the, the consultative steering group set up in November 1997 uh, actually made sure that we had that when we with the founding principles. But one of the things that I want to say, because I can see we're having difficulty with time here at the stage, was one of the most passionate uh, uh, discussions we had was when Susan Deakin was there, Professor Susan Deakin. Uh, she came from a specific uh, aspect of being former MSP, former minister, backbencher, academic and businesswoman. And uh, she really believed that, you know, uh, my personal perspective on this was she articulated uh, what the argument should be. You know, she said that during an official record that some of the work that took uh, place before the parliament was established was through the CSG, the Consultative Steering Group. Were I a member of this committee, I would want to dust down an awful lot of the existing codes, regulations and statutes and think about how to ensure that the issues embedded throughout the thinking, the practice of the institution as a whole and of individual members. I am passionate as I ever have been, albeit I am on the outside looking in rather than the inside looking out about ensuring that Holyrood seem to be open, accessible and transparent. And I think these are important part of the debate and I think she uh, has articulated uh, what many of us are actually believing that is the way forward for this. She also added that, you know, I'll add a couple of comments. Uh, I want to be totally transparent. Since I left the Parliament, I've spent my life working in academic community and looking at policy, public policy process through another lens, while also sitting in a mul multiplicity of boards in the private sector and for a number of charities and having advisory roles in the public sector. So I've seen many dimensions of this issue. So she actually saw from these various different perspectives that this is, as the convener said, a very complex uh, matter. And it's something she also said at one point that this is the Scottish Parliament. We do things a specific way. We, uh, we decided at a very early stage that we were going to have this our major uh, principles. But presiding officer, I too am passionate about this Parliament and how we go about our business. So if we decide to legislate, I think we must listen to as many voices as possible and ensure we do not lose the guiding principles of this place. This institution and this parliament deserves much respect and we need to remember the founding principles. Many thanks. <clears throat> I call on Jim Hume to be followed by Jamie Hepburn. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Of, of course, I welcome the opportunity to speak in today's debate on, on this very important issue. Liberal Democrats have long campaigned for more transparency and accountability in our political system. With that in mind, we do welcome the committee's inquiry into lobbying in Scotland, and I would add my thanks to those who have provided evidence to the inquiry. This Parliament has always prided itself on its openness. We are not only open for scrutiny, but also for people from all walks of life to be genuinely involved in the decisions which are made here. The way we do business here is different. It's, a, it's an inclusive approach to the development consideration and scrutiny of policy and legislation. 
I think the referendum campaign has reinforced and for some reignited that connection, which is, of course, to be wholly uh, welcomed. But what we must guard against is any move to regulate which would inhibit this free exchange of views, ideas and information. I believe that exchange is vital to the work we do here. It means that we're better informed. I believe it also means that we are closer to those we represent than in many other legislators. This exchange allows us to make legislation, I believe, fit for purpose, to take into account potential problems raised by groups or individuals outside of the Parliament. It means that we can explore issues fully and properly. I wouldn't want to see that change, nor do I believe that that would be the wish of any member of this Parliament. The difficulty, as others have already said, is the balance between making information available so that we are fully transparent and ensuring that the discussions and exchanges of information which are crucial are not curtailed by disproportionate heavy-handed regulation. So how would we define lobbying? Who knows? The definitions put forward to date all seem to have some flaws. Perhaps the best starting point is that of the UK Public Affairs Council, that lobbying means, and I quote, in a professional capacity, attempting to influence or advise those who wish to influence the UK Government, Parliament, the devolved legislators or administrations, regional or local government or other public bodies on any matter within their competence, unquote. But it's difficult within that to outline the parameters at which lobbying starts and information sharing ends. That's not to say that's not possible, but is uh, not quite there yet, I don't think. As Liberal Democrats, uh, of course, we believe in localism, community action, and these are values which we share with many third sector organisations. I believe that we are at our best when we work together for common goals and shared ambitions, working in partnership. To do that effectively means that barriers can be problematic. Having said that, we must ensure that we retain public tr uh, trust and confidence in the system. We should constantly scrutinise and strive to improve the openness of the par this Parliament, because to do less than that is to go against its founding principles. A common call is, of course, for MSPs and civil servants to publish their official diaries along similar lines to the duties on ministers at the moment. Uh, it would seem a reasonable thing to do, and I did note before I came in here that Stuart Stevenson already does do this. The call is something which I'm sure we'll all give careful consideration to. Uh, I don't think there's any clear answer as to whether a register or other regulation would serve to increase openness or indeed hinder it. Other le legislators have debated the same questions and most have come up with different <coughs> results. But the mature and cooperative manner in which we are discussing this issue in Scotland was, I think, reflected in the briefings we received by a whole range of groups ahead of uh, today's debate. <coughs> Some argued wholly in favour of reform, others against it. There were merits in all the briefings I saw. The one thing I would take exception to is this, was the statement by the Electoral Reform Society, which read, and I quote, the fact that it is not currently possible to find out who met who and why, and that money and favours are still being exchanged for access to politicians suggests that legal direction is required, unquote. The fact that money and favours are being exchanged for access to politicians. I think that uh, I'll not be the only one who is angered by a money and favours accus accusation, particularly as the convener said there was uh, and highlighted that there was absolutely no evidence of that happening. Anyway, it's important that this debate uh, continues, but it should do so on the assumption that all involved are already acting properly. In Scotland, there's nothing to suggest that this isn't the case. The reconnection which we have seen with politics and the political process over the last few months has seen a return of truly grassroots politics and a national conversation open to all. If we are to continue that conversation, then continued mutual trust and respect between politicians and the public has to be the foundation. Thank you. Thanks. And I now call on Jamie Hepburn to be followed by Graham Pearson, six minutes or thereby. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. Can I thank uh, the uh, Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee for their work in uh, this important area and also for bringing forward uh, today's uh, debate. At the outset, uh, I uh, feel I should uh, draw members' attention to my entry in the register of interests. Uh, I'm uh, a member of a variety of bodies whom could uh, easily come under the ambit of any framework we uh, agree uh, for uh, lobbying and also should declare that my wife uh, works uh, for Amnesty International and some of the work uh, she does could easily come under the terms of any 
uh, lobbying regulations we put in place, uh, President Officer. We're talking about transparency, so I felt it was important I should put that in the uh, record. Uh, and considering what to uh, contribute today, I, I was reminded of uh, President Kennedy's uh, 1961 address to the American Newspaper Publishers Association, uh, President Officer, because he addressed the uh, subject of uh, secrecy, and he uh, began his uh, contribution by saying the very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open uh, society. And I do believe it is appropriate, I do believe it is necessary, uh, in fact, that we put in place a system that uh, guards against uh, secrecy, or at least perceptions of uh, secrecy. But I do believe our starting premise uh, must be, as others have uh, mentioned, uh, to recognise the legitimacy uh, of uh, lobbying. This Parliament does uh, have a reputation for uh, not only transparency, but openness, and uh, lobbying uh, is clearly uh, a legitimate uh, part of our uh, process. So it is important, then, that whatever uh, we do uh, in the, this area is uh, proportionate and uh, reasonable. The Electoral Reform Society provided a useful uh, briefing, and they uh, highlighted the point, uh, and I think it was a point that Paul Martin very uh, astutely made, and it's been one that's made in the context of other uh, debates, that during the referendum uh, process we've seen a heightened uh, interest in civic and political life. It's something I think all members, uh, despite our differences and uh, views in terms of the referendum campaign itself, is one of the things that we've all welcomed out of the uh, referendum process. And in that uh, regard, it's uh, absolutely vital uh, that um, uh, members of the public uh, have faith in our transparency of operation and know uh, that who is lobbying us and who is uh, uh, contacting uh, us. And uh, the Electoral Reform Society actually have qu uh, quite a strong uh, point to make. Uh, they uh, conclude from their uh, contact with members of the public that uh, many members of the public have the impression that the powerful and connected have a better quality of access to politicians than they do as a citizen. Now, whether or not uh, we perceive that to actually be the case, if that is a perception out there, uh, then we would do well to uh, act on that perception. And the Electoral Reform Society uh, conclude that a register of uh, lobbyists uh, would be an appropriate way uh, to proceed. I note that uh, SCVO uh, take the alternative uh, viewpoint. Uh, they oppose the creation of a lobbying register. Uh, and they actually uh, talk about the, uh, the best way to deal with this as has been uh, discussed as the publication of uh, MSPs, a diary association of professional political consultants also uh, reached this conclusion. Let me say, President Officer, I do believe that uh, the burdens in terms of ensuring transparency in the area of lobbying should be a two-way street. I think there should be burdens that falls. I would say, I think for the reasons that were raised by my colleague John Mason, I am a little concerned about the idea uh, that uh, our diaries it should be uh, published as part of this uh, process, but uh, of course um, I, I know that the committee will uh, look at this matter and will see where the evidence it goes. Uh, if it's very brief, Mr Stewart. Very brief. Um, I, I, I too have some concerns about the diary, but it's also um, the ad hoc things that happen uh, out with, which are not normally in diaries. I travel a lot between Aberdeen and Edinburgh, as folk are well aware, uh, and you know, that in that journey, you get lots and lots of discussions with people. Do we have to add those in if we're going to publish diaries? Jimmy well, I think it's a fair point. I should say, Mr Stewart, my train journey is short, and I'm actually more likely to meet uh, my constituents on the uh, train journey home than I am any lobbyists, but I think it is a point that's uh, well made and uh, is worth putting on uh, the record. I did say I think this should be a two-way street, and I want to posit a suggestion. Perhaps the committee has considered it. Uh, if it hasn't, it can consider it as it goes forward. Right now, uh, where we have a declarable uh, interest in relation to a motion we put down, uh, an amendment to another member's uh, motion, uh, if it's a, a bill we're taking forward, um, we have to register uh, that uh, interest. Uh, indeed, uh, if it's uh, uh, even uh, interacting with another uh, member's motion, uh, signing it uh, in support of it, we have to register our interest. And I just wonder if where we, uh, as uh, elected representatives, take forward any of uh, these uh, particular areas of our work, if we have done so because we've been asked to do so by a lobbyist, perhaps uh, we should uh, be registering that. I know, for example, when uh, members bring forward amendments to bills uh, because they've uh, been asked to do so by organisations that members will invariably uh, make that point on the record. I just wonder if we should be doing that on a more uh, uh, formal uh, basis. Can I conclude and say what we shouldn't do in this area? We shouldn't uh, seek to ape Westminster's transparency of lobbying, non-party campaigning and trade union 
Administration Act, which came into effect on the 19th of September. I think this has been, uh, uh, seems to have been motivated less by desire for transparency of lobbying than it has by a desire to curb uh, third sector criticism of UK uh, government policy. They have put in place severe financial restrictions on such organisations' ability to work on their area of interest during the regulated election period. Martin Syme uh, from the SCV has described this as an affront uh, to democracy. I believe that people uh, want lobbying regulated primarily so there is transparency in organisations' influence on the legislative process, particularly where there is a commercial interest. I do not think they want to curb the activity of Friends of the Earth or WWF to raise environmental concerns. I do not think they want to uh, curb the activity of Amnesty International or Liberty to talk about human rights issues. We should ensure uh, transparency in our system, but we should not uh, clamp down on the legitimate right of organisations to criticise us, even where we don't like that criticism. It is part of uh, uh, the uh, life of uh, politics. I hope the committee can certainly take that point on board. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you. I now call on Graham Pearson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I uh, am glad to contribute to the debate this afternoon, uh, a debate about an issue which I think is vitally important to this Parliament in terms of fairness, justice and transparency. I would also record my gratitude to Stuart Stevenson and committee members who have played out many of the complex issues that we are trying to grapple with this afternoon. And I would record uh, my pleasure at hearing Helen Eady's men uh, name mentioned this afternoon, because she certainly was one uh, who uh, revealed to me the importance of integrity and conviction and principle when one indulges in parliamentary procedure. Uh, in that light, I would uh, concur with many of the issues that Malcolm Chisholm uh, made in his contribution this afternoon. The issue of lobbying is one that causes public concern. Whether that merely be on the basis of perception matters not. Uh, MSPs, civil servants, public officials can be compromised or thought to have been con compromised by lobbying. And that perception in itself is detrimental to all that we are trying to do here uh, and damages public faith and democracy. I am sure that many colleagues will have been contacted at one time or another by those who have reservations about the level of contact and lobbying eh, that occurs or is thought to occur in the confines of, of this building. That is not to say that trying to lobby, raise awareness and advance causes is of itself a problem. Nothing in the pro proposals, for instance, offered by my colleague Neil Finlay sought to prevent legitimate lobbying of members. A process properly utilised is designed to communicate, to inform and to share intelligence with those with a duty eh, to make policy decisions on behalf of the Scottish people. However, the problem reveals when it is believed to be somehow shady and eh, covert in the way in which policy is eh, confirmed. The impression or assumption by some that something untoward has or is occurring damages public life every bit as much as any prospect of reality. Lobbying is part of the political process. Despite uh, some of the more uncharitable perceptions, it does not necessarily mean undue influence, but it is uh, undeniably about influence and awareness and ultimately about having an impact on policy and decision making. Those who would lobby will on occasions have their own personal interests in a desired outcome. That interest might be based and reflect common good, but on other occasions it may be founded on commercial or financial advantage. Any perception that MSPs or any official are being swayed by lobbyists exerting special influence is damaging, especially when meetings and engagements take place or are thought to have taken place in secret. That is why I supported my colleague Neil Finlay's Members' Bill on Lobbying Transparency in 2012. 
I am glad that the Scottish Government agrees there is a need for greater transparency, and I look forward to studying the proposals that they will publish in due course, and of course the conclusions which eventually come from the inquiry from Standards and, and Procedures Committee. The sheer existence of a registrar, along with a code of administration, I think of itself will go a long way to ensuring that the good health of this Parliament in terms of its integrity is recognised. Uh, the recording of interactions between lobbyists and parliamentarians uh, should be acknowledged and recorded to ensure that they are upfront and above board. That does not inhibit discussions. It does, however, protect all of us engaged in such transactions from any perception that those discussions are of themselves suspect. Much has been said by members from all sides of the chamber about Westminster's approach to this issue and the fact that it just does not hit the mark. And I agree. It was suggested that such legislation would bring clarity to this whole area of relationships but in, indeed it has only muddied the water and made things more difficult in that Westminster environment. A number of charities, including Oxfam, have complained that, that this bill threatens to stifle public debate. Uh, the Political and Constitutional Reform Committee at Westminster criticised their own bill for being too narrow and focused on third-party lobbyists. So whatever proposals are brought forward to the Parliament, and unfortunately, it's the pressure on committee members to try and decide which way they will swing at the end of the day. But whatever proposals do come forward for us to consider further, genuine transparency should be at the heart and an ability to deliver confidence in the part of the public that any problem that could come in the future should be headed off at the pass by an upfront solution. We must deliver clear legislation and let's learn the lessons from our Westminster colleagues' experience and deliver what the public need. Clarity and purpose and a delivery on behalf of the members of this parliament in due honesty and integrity. Thank you, President Officer. Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. I'm also delighted to take part in this debate today in the lobbying, particularly as a member of the Standards Procedures and Public Appointments Committee within this Parliament. Can I say the comments I make in this speech this afternoon highlight comments made by various organisations who have presented their evidence to the committee? The committee has spent a great deal of time considering the issues surrounding the issue of lobbying, and I hope my remarks today to cover some of the evidence which the committee has considered over the past number of months. I'd like to share with the, committee, the Chamber the view of, the, of Epilepsy Scotland on lobbying. They state, although Epilepsy Scotland does not perceive that there is a tangible problem with lobbying in Scotland, we recognise that accountability around lobbying is integral to fair and open, open government. We do believe, however, that, that responsibility for this rests ultimately with MSPs and that any proposed legislation must be a proportionate response to an evidence issue. We believe that any regulation of lobbyists in Scotland should be specifically formed to re reflect the culture of political participation in Scotland and the working practices of the Scottish Parliament and must not create a barrier to parliamentary engagement for organisations representing the most vulnerable and disadvantaged members of society. Epilepsy Scotland makes interesting points in lobbying here in Scotland, presiding officer, and their approach of the importance of taking into account the culture of political participation here in Scotland is most welcome particularly given the incredible passionate participation we've seen, and it's already been mentioned, we've seen in the recent referendum on Scotland's future. This particular point also on the increased political awareness was also raised by the Electoral Reform Society of Scotland in their submission to the committee, in which they said, Scotland has witnessed a democratic awakening. Our citizens are engaged in a political discussion and are keen to participate in our democracy. Additionally, the Scottish Parliament is set to be charged with greater responsibility for decisions that will impact on the lives of the Scottish people. Now is the time to ensure that those decisions are made with the utmost transparency. 
We must ensure our citizens have faith in the system and that the system works for, the Scottish, for Scotland's citizens. A register of lobbyists detailing who is meeting with whom to discuss what and how much they are spending would greatly enhance the reputation of the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government. It would also serve to provide the public with the means to access information, access information about the decision making in our democracy. Another view on the way that we here in Scotland can address lobbying is that of the Association for Scottish Public Affairs. The ASAP said that MSPs legislate best when they are well informed. I agree with that. As the former Ethical Standards Commissioner Stuart Allen said, lobbying is a legitimate, is a legitimate and recognised part of the democratic process. There must be a level playing field. Lobbyists should not, be, not get better or worse access to MSPs than anyone else. Bad practice should be addressed, but we're not convinced by a register. Regulation should be proportionate. In the six years, the former Ethical Standards Commissioner, Stuart Allen, recorded no breach of lobbying rules. Lobbyists must behave ethically, but MSPs must have responsibilities too. MSPs should review, review their code of conduct. The Association for Scottish Public uh, Affairs suggests that MSPs publish their diaries and record details of meetings with lobbyists. The only problem I have with publishing diaries is when I worked with a finance firm, I had to detail my diary for the week, but I also had to record my retro diary because during the week things would happen and I, I wouldn't be able to fulfil my commitments sometimes. So the next week I had to retro my diary and say what, it had, what changed the previous week. That's the only point I'd make about diaries, keeping diaries. Residing officer, another organisation which has addressed the issue of lobbying with the committee is ASH Scotland. They have said, ASH supports the development of a lobbying register and believes any lobbying regulation should reflect Scotland's existing obligations under the WHO's Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, the FCTC, a legally binding international health treaty to which the UK is a signatory. FCTC guidelines advise parties to protect public health policies from commercial interests of the tobacco industry. Ash suggests that because of the tobacco industry's previous history of lobbying, that this demonstrates both overt and covert lobbying tactics aimed at undermining public health policy. It is critical to track all tobacco industry lobbying practices and relationships with third parties. The Chartered Institute of Public Relations, or the CIPR, have said that Scotland's Parliament has an opportunity to demonstrate how politics can allow and encourage the free exchange of information to make better policy and law. It can do this by working with the entire lobbying profession to offer a process through which the public can access more information about their work. I see I'm running out of time, President Officer. To conclude... Well, that's fine, Mr Lyle. Continue. Thank you very much. I will, I will put back in the, the paragraphs I was going to miss out there. I'd like to share with the Chamber the view of... Uh, uh, basically, the, the situation, the debate about transparency as lobbying has given way to one which focuses on professional standards. Any proposal should support the voluntary structures which regulate lobbyists and promote lobbying as a professional community. To conclude, presiding officer, I would like to thank each of the organisations whom I have cited in my speech today. I have expressed their thoughts and their evidence on lobbying but also the many organisations and individuals who have contributed to the committee inquiry. And I look forward to deliberations by the committee. And I, as yet, apart from the point I've made about retro diaries, put in your diary, but remember, when you have changed that diary, the next week you will have to go back and change that diary again. So we're going to give ourselves a lot of work. And that's the one point I would put. I haven't made up my mind yet in regards to this. I do hope the government take it forward. I support the point that uh, Mr Finlay uh, makes, but I don't have the concerns that he has because I know that, you know, we, as far as we are concerned, we are going to make the right decisions. I look forward to other contributions that colleagues, and, uh, and I welcome the colleagues' uh, contributions, and I thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Mr Lyle. I now, we now move to wind-up speeches. 
Uh, I call John Lamont, seven minutes. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I uh, welcome this afternoon's debate, which has, on the whole, reflected what I believe is the desire on behalf of the Committee, as well as the Scottish Government, to identify a set of proposals that all parties can stand behind. Although I remain to be convinced that a change in the law is necessary and indeed desirable, I acknowledge the wish to achieve cross-party consensus for improving the transparency of lobbying. The main point I would like to make this afternoon is that while we all must be careful not to label lobbying as a dirty business, it is a legitimate and worthwhile activity and one which is sometimes um, specifically required by statute. We have passed le legislation in this chamber which requires consultation and review and we must be mindful that any restrictions on lobbying may harm, harm the Parliament's ability to reform and improve on existing legislation. Lobbying helps generate effective, informed public policy and new laws. As an opposition politician, I understand the value that expert opinion on, le on legislation can have. In the absence of civil servants at our disposal, opposition parties find it helpful, the, su the suggestions from those in the know about the impact and likely, income, uh, sorry, likely outcome of new laws. Any changes to lobbying practice which makes it more difficult for this um, advice to be given therefore puts at risk the ability of opposition parties to hold the government to account. I understand the desire for transparency on this issue. Voters rightly deserve to know how legislation is made and who is talking to their politicians. While Leader of the Opposition at Westminster, David Cameron, predicted commercial lobbying was the next big scandal waiting to happen, which is why the UK government legislated to create a register for third party lobbyists. But, Presiding Officer, my concern is that there is very little evidence that we have a particular prob problem with lobbying here in Scotland. Those calling for reform have not yet produced the evidence to show that Scottish lobbyists are acting with anything other than integrity. David Cameron's concerns centred around commercial lobbyists, but Scotland has not developed a commercial lobbying culture to the same extent as exists in England and Wales. The Scottish Parliament is different to Westminster and in some ways already is more transparent, particularly the way in which our committees work. And in a smaller jurisdiction, it is perhaps easier for the public and for the press to keep track of what is going on. It, I'll give way to Mr Hepburn. Jamie Hepburn. I was intrigued where the member, maybe I picked him up wrong, he said David Cameron's primary concern was corporate interest in the lobbying sector. Why is it then that his government's legislation has massively covered the activities of the third sector rather than the uh, corporate sector? John well, Norman? The, the primary concern of the Prime Minister was indeed um, commercial lobbying, but indeed there's, there's other aspects of the legislation um, south of the border which, which does uncover uh, the voluntary sector. But I believe um, the, the government has worked well with some of the, the voluntary groups to bring them um, on board, organisations like the National Council for Voluntary Organisations, which initially opposed the new laws um, at Westminster, working with the U UK government, eventually they were persuaded that they were worthy of um, support. Now, it's worth um, reflecting that there are already checks and balances in place, and that's an element of regulation already exists in Scotland. Um, umbrella bodies and individual companies have voluntary codes of conduct or registration schemes for their members and staff, which are generally described as a form of self-regulation. The Association of Professional Political Consultants, the Public Relations Consultants um, Association and the Chartered Institution of Public Relations, the three main membership or organisations for public affairs practitioners, each require their relevant members to abide by their respective codes of conduct. The APPC and the UKPAC have similar registers. Freedom of information legislation can and has been used to determine information about meetings between government staff, ministers, MSPs and lobbyists. On this, I disagree with the organisation Spinwatch, who told the Standards Committee that a relative dearth of investigative journalism meant that it was not clear whether there was a problem with inappropriate lobbying in Scotland. Journalists in Scotland, I would suggest, are a persistent bunch and I have no doubt in their abilities to find a story or a scandal if one were to exist. Added to this, the interests of members um, of the Scottish Parliament Act 2006 
rightly prohibits MSPs from receiving payment from lobbyists, and the Code of Conduct for MSPs and the Ministerial Code of Conduct reminds members of their responsibilities when dealing with, dealing with lobbyists. So there is little evidence lobbyists are acting in an underhand way in Scotland, and some mechanisms already exist to promote transparency. It is therefore within this context that I remain somewhat sceptical about a change in the law as proposed by Neil Finlay as being necessary or desirable. Though I am open to persuasion, I accept the point that although there might, not be widespread, there might not be a widespread problem, that does not mean that additional transparency would not help prevent a problem from emerging in the future. Presenting officer, the reason I am cautious about this is because of what we risk losing by the creation of a lobbying register. Any change in the law must therefore be proportionate so as not to act as a deterrent from those seeking to engage in a legitimate way. If we were to introduce charges or overly onerous re re regulation, I have no doubt that many third sector organisations and smaller businesses would be unable to carry on with their lobbying activity. I am also sure that some larger organisations might come to the conclusion that it is no longer in their interest to make re representations to politicians in an effort to improve legislation. As Professor Susan Deacon from Edinburgh University told the Standards Committee, if the Parliament's aim and aspiration is to encourage openness and access and a free flow of information and to build understanding, the last thing that we, need, that we want is people worrying about how they are labelled and whether they are comp complying with the rules before they speak to politicians. Finally, Presiding Officer, I would like to point out that while the Scottish lobbying environment may be different to Westminster's, we must not ignore the legislation that has been passed south of the border. Many lobbyists work across the United Kingdom and the introduction of our two wildly different schemes could introduce unnecessary complexity. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Mr Lamont. I now call Neil Friendly. Mr Friendly, seven minutes. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. And can I uh, thank the committee and the convener uh, for their report. Uh, I still am not sure why it was needed and why indeed the committee uh, had its inquiry. However, we are where we are. Um, the Scottish Government uh, intimated to me that they were going to take over my bill uh, almost 17 months ago on the very last day before recess, just before the time, the egg timer was running down and I would have been able to pursue the bill uh, myself, but they uh, said they would take it forward and that they were minded to legislate uh, my proposal. But so far, nothing. No legislation in the legislative programme. I fully expect uh, the proposal to be in the new First Minister's legislative programme. And can I say absolutely clearly just now, if it's not in the uh, legislative uh, programme, then I will return with my bill immediately. Um, I genuinely think that there is a game has been played with this bill, and this uh, inquiry has been an attempt to kick the bill into the long grass for as long as possible. I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong, but I fear that that may be the case. Certainly. McLeod. I wonder if Mr. Finlay, I mean. Would Mr Finlay accept that your bill generated a huge amount, that his bill generated a huge amount of interest and that if this bill goes forward and becomes an act, it will fundamentally affect the standards and procedures of this parliament. Therefore, the Standards and Procedures Committee is the correct committee to scrutinise the ideas put forward. Do, does Mr Finlay not want the evidence gathering that we're going through at this moment or is he arrogantly saying that Mr Finlay's ideas for the bill are all that we need to look at. No, I, I think the committee could have um, looked at this if it wanted to some time ago. But it has been a long delay and it's taken a long time to get to this position. So we are where we are and we have to move on and I expect it to be in the legislative programme. Can I apologise for um, not fo following Mr Stevenson's every utterance on Twitter? I'm sure for his legions of followers. It's a, it's a riveting daily uh, intake of news and excitement, but uh, I, I might try and dip into it on the odd occasion, but um, I'll try and hold myself back from that. Um, can, I, can I make it clear that lobbying is a, a legitimate part of the democratic process? I've never said anything other than that. I think the, the briefings that are provided, the advice that we get from a whole range of organisations, the comment on legislation, is all very good. And can I particularly commend Mr Hepburn's uh, wife, as he's uh, mentioned her uh, uh, today, 
in the, uh, and the briefings that she provides for Amnesty, because they are excellent, and you can pass on my regards to her for that. But I, I think a number of organisations provide us with excellent uh, 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 briefings, and that uh, I would never uh, seek uh, to stop continuing. So I, would no, I wouldn't seek to stop that. Um, this bill, my proposal, uh, as I put forward, is simply an attempt to throw light on the lobbying uh, uh, and uh, the lobbying process and make it more open and transparent. As many people have said, in line with the principles of this parliament of accountability, openness, equal opportunities and power sharing. This is not about stopping any of that. It's about enhancing all of it. So could we uh, do more to enhance those principles? Well, I think we can. Why shouldn't the public know who we meet, uh, what we are meeting about, and if contracts are being won or government policy changed or questions being asked or whatever, people are able to see that as a result. We are supposed to act in the name of the people who uh, elect us to come here. Therefore, I think they have and should have the right to know what is going on. So the register that I propose, I want to be a very simple register. I want it to be unburdensome. It would be a simple online form that could be completed. What, in effect, people are being asked to complete is an A4 form online. If you think of how that would work, you could have a template on your computer with all the information populated already, company name, if it's a company, name and address, where they're registered, who the person making the contact is, and actually what would need filled in on a quarterly or whatever uh, basis we, we agree would be a very limited amount of information. So the burden on those uh, individuals would be very, very limited. Um, and I uh, accept that there is an issue, and have always accepted there is an issue about proportionality. The analogy I would give is, uh, is uh, something like the Scout Association. I'm sure that groups like that come to all MSPs and maybe say, can you help us get the hire of a hall for free from the council or something like that from a church or whatever. Of course, that's not lobbying. That's constituency contact that's just normal. However, if the Scout Association were involved in a bidding round for youth work that was several million pounds or whatever, and they hired a lobbying firm or an in-house lobbyist in order to try and ensure that they won that contract, that's a different relationship that we would have with them, and that would, I believe, be registrable. So, there would be thresholds in place. I think the threshold idea is a good one because it, it differentiates between small-scale lobbying and something that happens uh, on a bigger level. There is a, a huge difference between lobbying that costs 500 quid and lobbying that maybe costs 50,000 pounds. That is a clear, there's a clear difference here. And people, um, Malcolm Chisholm mentioned some of the smaller organisations. I think we could also have a situation where smaller organisations, should they choose to do so, voluntar voluntarily register, even if they are underneath the threshold. That would be their right to do so. On the issue of diaries, I have no problem with publicising my diary, but I think there are sensitive issues like John Mason uh, referred to, and equally the whole issue about civil servants and special advisers comes into that as well. Um, I think the industry and the sector have nothing to fear. And I th indeed, I think it will protect the, the reputation of the, the players in the industry who take pride in their work and pride in what they do. Uh, and they will have nothing to fear from that. Um, the onus would be on the lobbyists to register. But there will be no creeping around the corner with magnifying glasses wondering what people are doing. There would be a system like the register of members' interests, where if a complaint was made, then there would be an investigation. That's how I see it working. Now, of course, we've seen scandals elsewhere. We've seen Cash for Questions, Lobbygate, the Adam Verity, Bell Pottinger cases, all of these things, all of these scandals that have happened elsewhere damage our democracy. And it would only take one big scandal to set pol Scottish politics back decades. So I think we should work together to create a system here that ensures that that never happens. Uh, and with, final point, President Officer, I've got a lot more I could say, but final point. With increased powers to this Parliament comes increased lobbying. Prior to this Parliament being created, the lobbying industry was almost non-existent in Scotland. But with the Parliament came the lobbying industry. And with further powers that will come with the Scotland Act, we will see lobbying increasing again. And if we have further constitutional change, 
will have even more lobbying again. This is about protecting our democracy, and we need to invest in that, even if it costs us money to set up the register. I would ask everyone to seriously consider whether, if we reject this proposal, if we don't set up the register, what will the view of the people out there be? Will it be that we're in interested in more openness, or will it be they're trying to hide something? I know that that is not what mem members here cooperate and operate properly in this place. Let's keep it that way and let's not have that accusation levelled against us. I now call Joe Fitzpatrick, Minister, eight minutes. Presiding officer, um, I want to thank everyone in the chamber. I, I thought it's been a, a really, really good debate. Um, I think there, there's much more common ground than, than there is division across the, the, uh, across the chamber. And that was certainly the approach that the government was hoping that we would be able to take um, I have certainly found the contributions from members very interesting and, and helpful, and I am sure that the committee will be able to draw much from the, 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 the comments um, of, of members going forward. Today's contributions demonstrate that many issues arise, many issues that arise when we are considering topics of lobbying and transparency are, are, are very, very complex. Before I, I, I go and talk about some of them and, and talk about some of them, other contributions. I think I probably want to start with um, just responding to Mr Finlay's earlier, earlier remarks. I, I had hoped to be able to bring him in. I, I hadn't realised that at that time we were becoming tight of, um, on, on, on time. But uh, um, let me be, be clear, it, it remains um, our intention to take, forward, to, to take this forward. It, it remains absolutely. But this is a very complex issue and the, the, the government feels that it is absolutely appropriate that the committee takes the time to fully understand all those complex issues and that the government then takes time to consider the committee's deliberations carefully before coming to a conclusion about how best to legislate. But, but let me be absolutely clear. Okay. Just to be absolutely clear, is he telling us today that this will be in the legislative programme coming up? This parliament does not have much longer to run. Can he tell us whether it will be in the list? Of course, Mr Finlay um, will be aware that I'm not going to stand here and um, discuss the, the government's legislative programme. However, Mr Finlay will be aware of standing orders and be aware of um, our intentions, as um, I had previously remained to him, and, and, and that remains. But I, I think we're actually in a better place than I could ever have imagined that we could get to in terms of managing to, to take this forward in a way that not only bring, brings on board um, everybody in this chamber, but potentially we can find a way to pull on, on side um, people out with the parliament, both lobbyists and, and other groups on both sides of the argument. I think that the work that the committee has done has been hugely helpful in, 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 in helping us move that forward. So I certainly would... Um, I think I would be failing in my, my duty to this Parliament if, if we weren't prepared to consider the deliberations of that committee before we move further forward. As, as the debate, debate started, um, Paul Martin, I think, kicked, kicked off with some very important points. I think um, the first point about access to this place is, is absolutely crucial. It's one of the things that I think we are all very, very proud of is that um, we see and the public see this parliament as open and accessible. And th that's absolutely clear that, that, that we have to find a way to protect that as we, as we, as we move forward in, these, um, in, in, in taking this, this issue forward. Um, and Mr Martin also talked about how that actually that's intensified because of the referendum as more people are now um, having a, an interest in, in policy making, interest in politics, we have a duty to, I think, um, make sure that we actually make that, that, that actually easier of everything. But at the same time, I don't see why we can't find ways to make it more transparent too. One of the areas that Mr Martin mentioned was about the regulation of former ministers. And I guess it's, it's one of the things that we sometimes forget to do is that we, we maybe don't talk about the robustness of the framework that we already have. And it was very helpful um, that the convener was able to um, give us some outline in terms of the regulations which are in place. But we, we do have some very robust regulations in place and maybe we should talk about them more often. So maybe this, this is a good opportunity for us to have done that. Um, Cameron 
Buchanan summarised the powerful arguments from both sides of the debate, as, as, as have been heard through the evidence session, um, neatly demonstrating the task facing the committee. And none of us should underestimate that task to try and um, pull together what sometimes appear to be some very divergent um, views and opinions. And, and, I, and I think that's very, very, um, very good. And obviously, the, the committee will, will have a job to do in in weighing up those sometimes competing arguments, but I, I think you are all up to the task and you have certainly shown your, your ability to, to do that going forward. Fiona McLeod raised the recurring question of what is lobbying, and a register might under, underline the openness and accessibility of the Parliament. Um, that exactly echoes the first um, of the Government's key principles, because while we want to absolutely um, find a way to increase transparency and we, we, we must, must maintain the openness that this Parliament is so proud of, the openness that, that um, Paul Martin um, mentioned too. George Adam, um, in, in his comments, um, and his comments that I delude to in my opening remarks, said that we can't go down the road of the UK's legislation and Mr Adams made a, a very good point. Uh, Mr Finlay made it very clear that his proposals were nothing like the UK government's uh, legislation. And can I put on the record that if they were, we would absolutely not have made any intention to go forward. Because I think what the, the UK government did um, was actually to turn the clock back in, in, in exactly the wrong way and do exactly the wrong things um, for openness, transparency and, and ability to participate. Um, it was um, legislation that was taken forward in a very partisan, partisan way and I think there's already calls for it to be repealed from um, across benches down south and obviously also from um, external organisations. Um, I also thought um, George Adam um, mentioned Susan Deakin's perspective on this very complex topic and I, and I, and I agree with George that I thought um, Susan Deakin's um, contributions were, were, were very useful for us in, in taking this forward, very well thought out um, going forward. Jamie Rep Hepburn, um, I, I think I will also put on record my thanks to his wife and for all the work she does because um, I think a number of members have pointed out that we in this parliament don't see lobbying in, as some sort of a dirty word um, uh, the way it's maybe seen elsewhere. Lobbying is, is hugely useful to us as the, the Holyrood um, uh, article of January of this year um, indicated. We, we just could not do our job without the assistance of, of the many organisations that, that help us come to, the, to a conclusion. But I, I, do, I do think Jamie's point, Jamie Hepburn's point about how perhaps we can make that more transparent might be helpful. And actually, I think it might also be helpful to those organisations if a member has worked with the you RSPB, last 30 seconds, the RSPB for instance, then surely it's in the interest of the RSPB that if that then ends up as an amendment coming forward, that that is somehow recorded properly. And it's in it because it's something positive. We should never see these things as positive. Signing officer, at, at the start, I mentioned three very important principles. And I just want to, to close with those principles, because I think if we can stick to those, the principles which are, are guiding the government's thinking, then I think we will find a way of of taking legislation forward in, in the best possible way for this Parliament. And that's firstly that we must not erode the Parliament's principles of openness, ease of access and accountability. Secondly, any proposed measures must com complement our existing frameworks without compromising their effective operation. And thirdly, any solution must be proportionate, simple in operation and able to command broad support within and out with our Parliament. Presiding, Presiding Officer, I thank you for the, the, thank the Chamber for this debate. I think it's been really, really useful. I'm sure the Committee will carefully deliberate on the points that have been made today and the convener's decision to proactively publish such engagements. His engagements on his website will be helpful to all of us. Thank you very much. I now call on Margaret McDougall to wind up the debate for the Committee. Ms McDougall, nine minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I close this debate as the Vice Convener of Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. I'd like to start by saying how much I have enjoyed this debate. Members right across the Chamber have covered so many perspectives on the issue. 
And I'll reflect on uh, a few. I think I've got uh, everyone's name. Uh, Joe Fitzsimmons said the committee needs to do the work properly and get it right, so we don't need to go back to it, um, to whatever decision we decide on. Paul Martin mentioned how engaged the Scottish public are after the referendum, and we should maintain that interest. Cameron Buchanan found it very difficult to form an opinion, despite hearing all the evidence, because the subject is so complex. Fiona McLeod gave her examples of differing views of constituents. Malcolm Chisholm reminded us that proportionality was required. George Adams spoke about the reputation of the Parliament, and this is the first speech that I've heard uh, George Adams speak in, where he hasn't actually mentioned Paisley once. <laughs> so, well done, George. In, sorry, presiding officer. Uh, Jim Hume spoke of public trust and confidence in Parliament. Jamie Hepburn referred to lobbyists influencing bills. Graham Pearson reminded us lobbying is part of the political process. Richard Lyle raised that MSPs work best when well informed. John Lamont spoke about the differences between this parliament and Westminster parliament. Neil Finlay spoke about his wish to bring the principles of openness and accountability through a register of lobbying. There was also a lively discussion on Facebook and Twitter in advance of this debate, and I'm sure it continued throughout the debate itself. And I hope, if I've got time uh, during the, my time speaking, that I can go back to, and refer to some of those. Beyond collecting helpful insight into members' perspectives, we have also achieved another aim of the debate, to create an example of how positive and valuable being lobbied can be. The more voices we hear from, the more sources of information we tap into, the more informed we are and the richer the basis for our scrutiny and our policy development can be. I'd like to thank Neil Finlay, MSP. The, committee, the committee's inquiry was instigated in large part of the basis of Neil Finlay's proposal for a member's bill, and the committee would like to thank him for his central role in bringing this important issue to Parliament. I'd also like to thank everyone who have played a part in informing this debate, whether they are in the Chamber, were quoted by those speaking in this Chamber, or made comments in advance on social media. In addition, can I thank those who have contributed to the inquiry, some of whom have come to watch the debate in person today, and I hope they have uh, enjoyed the debate. I'd also like to thank the committee clerks for making arrangements for the debate and for their support throughout the inquiry. As I'm speaking in my capacity as Deputy Convener, I'd like to talk a little now about what happens next. I'm sure all those contributing want to know how long their views will be taken into account even how their views will be taken into account. The committee plans to discuss all of the evidence received, including the full official report of this debate and contributions on Twitter and Facebook at its next meeting. It will then start to move towards a report featuring recommendations for change. I'm sure none of you will envy us that task, given the many and varied views on this issue. And needless to say, the committee cannot bring about change alone, given the potential impact of this work on all MSPs. Any recommendations will need to be endorsed by Parliament as a whole. For example, if the committee recommends we change the rules on lobbying in the Code of Conduct for MSPs, or if there is legislation for a statutory register, we cannot move forward with these changes without the support of Parliament as a whole. One moment, Ms McDougall. There's far too much chattering as people who have not been part of the debate are now coming to the Chamber. Please show the member courtesy who has at least sat through the debate and is now making her contribution. Ms McDougall. Thank you. The, the committee is clear that there is a case for change and that its recommendations to Parliament must seek to ensure sufficient transparency for citizens seeking information on how lobbyists seek to influence policy formulation and scrutiny processes, 
and sufficient controls to prevent or expose any lobbyists seeking inappropriate access to or to exert undue influence over politicians or officials. In considering options for the future, it's helpful to look at what we already do. In terms of checks and balances, MSPs have rules to adhere to on contact with lobbyists in the Code of Conduct, including registering anything received that could be perceived to influence their behaviour as a politician. There are also criminal sanctions for failure to register or to declare any registration during relevant parliamentary proceedings. And should anyone engage in paid advocacy, and there has been no cases of that yet, then a prison sentence can be imposed. There are additional requirements placed on ministers, including being required to report on any inappropriate attempts to engage with them to the head of the civil service. On the side of the lobbyists, witnesses listed ways in which lobbyists currently regulate themselves or are subject to legislation, for example, charities must disclose information to the charities regulator. Consultant lobbyists highlighted the new registration system to be imposed at UK level and the need for any additional regulation in Scotland to be coordinated with this. In terms of making information on lobbying activity public, there is information in the public domain on the Parliament's website. The Register of Interest is published, as is information on the activities of cross-party groups and the funding they receive. Details of all those contributing to the formulation of government policy and committee scrutiny of it is in the public domain as are details of those organising events in the Parliament and participating in our Futures Forum and the Business Exchange. We also publish details of advisors and research consultants used by the Parliament. And similarly, the Government publishes details of special advisors. The Scottish Government also seeks to publish details of meetings between ministers and outside bodies on a rolling basis. I mean, I'll just read out to you some quotes that we have had on the uh, tweet, tweet, tweets. Bring your last tweets, minute, Mr. Even. Google. Um, some of the tweets that have, we have received um, from Alec, Alan McKenzie wrote, the public must have access to all information necessary to form an opinion as to the influence and extent of any form of lobbying. The public must understand who has influenced decisions and why they have attempted to do so. Nick Godfrey wrote, we must keep it open and above board to try to restore some trust. If lobbyists are sincere, why would they need to hide anything? And if politicians have no conflict of interest, between their elected post and any private interests, then they should have no objections to clarity and transparency either. But above all, whatever the Scottish Parliament decides, it must be seen to be more open and democratic than Westminster to avoid losing the newly awakened political enthusiasm in the Scottish electorate. You need to bring your remarks to a close now. Okay, I'm just closing, presiding officer. As we've heard today, there are strong voices saying that this is not enough. While the question of whether we need a statutory or a voluntary register is central to the debate, there are other areas where the committee has already agreed that more could be done. For example, we want to work with Digital Parliament programme to make information already in the public domain more accessible. We also want to look at what more information we could or should publish. Our starting point in considering all of this should, of course, be what would the citizen want to know? Thank you. Many thanks, Ms McDougall. That concludes the debate on the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. In one moment, Mr uh, Simpson, I'm um, going to finish this, on its inquiry into lobbying. Mr Simpson, you have a point of order. Thank you, Thank you Presiding Officer. During yesterday's living wage debate, 
I accepted an intervention from the Minister, Angela Constance, at the point when I specifically mentioned and referred to the McRobert Arts Centre as an organisation grant funded through Creative Scotland. I did not refer to directly funded organisation, yet during her intervention, the Minister said, and I quote, all cultural bodies are subject to and must comply fully with the Scottish Government's public sector pay policy, which includes the payment of the Scottish living wage as a minimum for all staff. Creative Scotland informs me that whilst they encourage those in receipt of grants to pay a living wage, they cannot make it mandatory. And this is despite the Minister giving a clear impression to the Chamber that this was the case. I have spoken to a number of organisations and they confirm that they do not pay all their staff a living wage. Would the presiding officer invite the minister to correct the official report as our claim has proved to be inaccurate? Thank you for the advance notice of the point of order. As the member knows and as all members know, the presiding officer is not responsible for the content or the veracity of a member's speech, but the Cabinet Secretary has heard what you've got to say and I'm sure she will reflect upon it. We now move to decision time. There are no questions to be put as a result of today's business. I now close the meeting.